We're talking Atlanta Falcons football on the Our Lads Football Network and the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe if you're an Atlanta Falcons fan. Anytime we uh, talk Atlanta Falcons football, we're going to be talking to this man, Kevin Knight from the Falcoholic at thefalcoholic.com. How's it going, Kevin? Good, good. It's been it's been a minute, Greg. I think it was pre-draft was the last time we talked. So happy to to be back on because. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard the Falcons did uh, make some some moves in the draft that people are talking about. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I would have to think too, and this is maybe good for your channel because <laughs> I, I would believe because I did, I, I would have to believe that there's a lot of people who wanted to know how Falcons insiders and fans reacted, mm -hmm. and yeah. you had a lot you had live coverage, so I know you knew before your co-host did. <laughs> so you were trying to keep it, uh, and you did a good job of, uh, yep. you know, hiding uh, the fact that, <laughs> yeah, that you, you had a good poker face. And, uh, yeah, that was something else. So we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But, yeah, I mean, did it help the channel out? I, I would imagine <laughs> it, was good, it would yeah. have. I mean, yeah, that aspect was definitely good. I, I know it was our best uh, our best draft show. I think it's going to end up as our the, the day one draft show. It's probably going to end up as our most, most watched show uh, <laughs> yeah. when it's all said and done. So. Good. Yeah, it's, it's good for the channel, then, no yeah. doubt. I mean, if the Fal as long as the Falcons aren't boring, usually it's good. So, <laughs> okay. And then, of course, uh, you were referencing the last time we spoke because we're in the same dynasty league together with some fellow uh, OFN insiders and also uh, the uh, five, uh, five, six of uh, some really top end uh, fantasy football uh, uh, experts, including of course, uh, the leaders there at draft sharks. So it's a very competitive league and we pulled off our first trade. You and I did. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, you were able to, what was that? So you got cook, mm -hmm. uh, uh, James cook from Buffalo. And, uh, what mm -hmm. did I, I got the draft pick. I think you got the second and fourth. Okay. Yeah. So, I, mm -hmm. so um, and I used that because I wanted to get, I believe that was the one that I got Mitchell, the wide mm -hmm. receiver. From the Colts because I needed a, yeah, yeah. a really good number one receiving prospect, and I felt mm -hmm. that he was the last guy that I really felt confident was going to be on the list that I could get, and that's why I wanted him. That's why I made that move. So yeah, yeah, that makes no. I desperately needed a running back because my two running backs were Aaron Jones and Austin Eckler, and I just can't see them uh, playing all all seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that could be really good. Year. Yeah, yeah, so, but, yeah, yeah. You're right, and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I also thought it was uh, interesting because I was really, I thought for like for the entire draft that I was going to end up, uh, with, uh, Jared Wiley. I was like, you know what? Nobody's going to pick him. I'm going to get him at around a fourth round. I know I'm going to get him. He's there. It's somebody I believe in for the future. And then when the time came, there was just other guys that were other prospects that were on there that I said, I, I just, I have to go with the other prospects. It's just, <laughs> I can't do this. And I was glad to see that you picked them up, especially yeah, since you have yeah. Travis Kelsey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that it was, was too, made too much sense. Yeah. Well, <laughs> tight end is like, I was like, do I really need another tight end? I've got Kelsey. I've got Sam Laporta. I've got Cole Komet. Do I really need another tight end? Yes. Yeah. You never, I'm just going to hoard them like infinity stones. I'm going to call the market on tight end. So I think it's perfect. Yeah. Cause uh, if Kelsey does retire in the next year or two, maybe you've got his uh, replacement and uh, he's got a lot of potential anyway. Oh, yeah. So that's uh, we're going to talk more about fantasy uh, from the Atlanta Falcons point of view, including their top draft pick. So um, we might as well start, uh, go head on in uh, with the whole uh, Penix deal. And uh, it, you've had now some time to think about it. And the fans have had a little bit of a breather to think about it. Uh, has anybody, do you think it's changed at all or is it way too soon? No, I mean, fans have definitely come around on the pick, which again, it's, it's to be expected. Nobody likes to be sour grapes about their team's pick. I mean, no matter what, like uh, it's just, it's it's no fun you know this is supposed to be a fun thing uh and and people are going to come around on picks that's just the nature of it um and it's also the nature of we're not going to really know the answer to the to most of the questions people are asking in terms of was it a good pick was it a good move you know no one like for, for any player we're not really going to find out for at least a year maybe two maybe three even for some yeah. guys so you hope so uh, yes yeah so at, it's always going to tend toward optimism for most except for the the true haters uh which of course you know, they're going to be haters no matter what. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, good for them. But yeah, it, people have come around on it. I mean, I, I think it's just, it, it was very jarring in the moment. You know, you don't, this is not something that's really been done. Uh, not to this level. This is 
this is by far the most expensive version of this particular style of, of team building that's ever been attempted. Whereas, you know, you sign the quarterback to the most expensive contract in free agency, and then you draft a quarterback in the top 10. We've seen, <laughs> we've seen guys that have been on long-term contracts and drafting a quarterback in the first round. We've seen, you know, that done a couple of times recently, you know, with Mahomes, with, with Alex Smith, uh, Mahomes and Alex Smith. We've seen it with Jordan Love. We've seen that, that has been done, but not where they've signed a quarterback that year, like like weeks <laughs> weeks prior, and then taking someone in the top ten. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why it happened. Um, you know, one of them is that the the coaching staff knew they had to fix quarterback when they came in, but they didn't have a lot of time to to set their feet because they they got hired and then free agent. You know, by the time everyone's settled and they have assembled all of the assistants and everyone's there, free agency is like a week away. So they're like, okay, we need to fix quarterback. We're gonna go get the best quarterback we can. And then the draft board was finalized after that. And they were like, actually, we'd love Michael Pettix too. So we'll see if we can get him. Um, and, you know, that that's one of the things. If you have to bring in a new coaching staff, your, your timeline in the offseason is constricted. And, you know, you have to make decisions without having all of the information digested from your scouting department, all that stuff. And um, that's probably played into the sort of what happened with the, the timing and, and all that stuff. But, uh, it, you know, Getting, if you're going to gamble on any position in the NFL, you should gamble on quarterback because that's the one sure. that has the biggest payout. You're going to, you know, if, if you get it right, there's almost no way that you can overpay for a franchise quarterback. If you get a franchise quarterback, you could spend three first round picks. You could spend, you know, $300 million. You could do it as long as the quarterback's good and you're winning football games, you can't really overspend. So in that way, there's always upside for it. And in reality, the Falcons didn't spend that much. I mean, Kirk Cousins' deal is effectively two years with a couple of team options. And while it's not cheap to, to get rid of him after the second year, it's definitely not prohibitive in any way. I mean, you look at some of the guys who've been moved on recently. Like Russell Wilson is a great example. Sure. Um, you know, uh, Daniel Jones probably going to be an example here shortly um, in the next you know year or so. Um, you, know, you could do a lot worse than what the Falcons are going to be looking at with Cousins after two years, which is... If you do that as a post June first cut, you're looking at like twelve and a half million a year for two years, which is basically nothing for for quarterbacks. So, um, it's it's easy to get out of after two years. And you know, Penix is if you were going to gamble on one of these prospects outside of the top couple of guys to become, you know, to have the uh, the potential of becoming a top ten quarterback, you, Penix is the one that has the traits to do that. Of all those guys, you know, even someone like JJ McCarthy, I don't think has the level of traits that, that he does, you know, obviously McCarthy's a bit younger, but um, you know, so they're, they're, they're taking a big gamble here. It's a bold move, but uh, clearly they, they view him as that type of quarterback prospect and they were willing to piss off everyone <laughs> to, to go do it. So now, now they just give him credit ready. for that. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who made that decision? Is that like, who's, who's the last guy is, is it, is it Fontenot? Is it McKay? Who's making the final call? They they claim it's all collaborative. I McKay is not involved anymore. Not um, involved anymore. So just yeah. get that out of everybody's head. He's no yeah. longer that much that influential like, with the. With I the feel team. like it was becoming a distraction. Um, you know, and and they did this to themselves when they had the the press conference after Arthur Smith was fired without Terry Fontenot there and with McKay there. I think after that they realized, oh wait, this is becoming a distraction. We we can't have McKay here anymore. Okay. Um, and they so they've more or less moved him out of football ops to, to more business side stuff. Um, but honestly, I think Raheem Morris, the head coach, the new head coach, is the one who's pushed for it probably more than anyone because when he was the interim head coach back in 2020, his pitch to become the next head coach was that we needed to get a succession plan for Matt Ryan. Like, we need a succession plan for Matt Ryan. We need to do this immediately. We can't okay. wait. We don't know how much longer Matt's going to be playing at a high level and, and whatnot. And he was absolutely right about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the team did not do that. Um, but it, it checks out that as soon as he got back on the team and, and has a quarterback that now the same age Matt Ryan was in 2021 uh, under yeah, contract yeah. that he wanted to do the same strategy, which is we're going to yeah. get a successful kind of quarterback. And um, it's obviously, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily help the team as much this year. Um, and I think a lot of people were expecting more of an all in approach when you do have a quarterback like Kirk cousins signed for that type of money. But uh, I think this is more of a, you know, mini rebuild type of year where they're going to 
obviously they're they're expecting to put, to compete for the playoffs. It's the NFC South. You know, they play one of the easiest schedules. Uh, the first month of the season is not easy. That's for sure. But after that, it, it does calm down, especially in the second half. And, um, you know, they, they just don't have a lot of obstacles in their way, assuming that they can get past the Bucks. You know, I think the Saints are probably going to – this is probably the year the Saints take a dirt nap. Um, that offensive line is just – it's taken too much damage and Ryan Ramchick not being able to play. It's just a brutal yeah. blow for them. Um, so it, they really don't have too much resistance to winning the NFC South. And that doesn't mean they're just, they're going to be this great team, but sure. uh, they probably felt like, you know, that what they said, which is that we think we're going to make the playoffs. We don't think we're going to be able to be taking a top 10 quarterback again, anytime soon without, expending significant resources so we'd rather expend the one pick now than expend multiple picks later um and now it just depends on if panics works out or not and that's, if that's he does it. if he does they'll look like geniuses and if he doesn't you know people will be wondering you know what if they had taken somebody else and actually built the team more around cousins and uh you know we'll, we'll, we're going to be talking about that a lot i'm sure over the next two or three years so and you know the more i think about it uh, because Dallas Turner was a big name, everybody thought he that that's it's, it's gonna be receiver or Turner, but most people thought Turner. And I was never high on Turner, I'm just not. I think he's a good ball player, I think he's a fine ball player, I just don't think he's a special ball player, I don't think he's a top 10 ball player. And maybe that was part of the thinking as well. Was you tell me, was it look, there's just not that player, there's not that difference maker, they they went out. They got Mooney. They got more. They have London. So they've got the receivers. Maybe, do you think that's what it was also about? Not just, oh, we got to get a quarterback. The quarterback's there. It's a deep quarterback class. We're getting a quarterback. Or it was it, yeah, we'd like to get a quarterback. And I just, I, I don't think that, that there's, just, there's a special player at eight. So unless we trade back, it does make a lot of sense. Let's just go get the quarterback now. Yeah, I, I think the trade back was probably on the table. I, th I think the Raiders wanted Penix. Um, now, obviously the Falcons weren't going to trade Penix to the Raiders, but um, which again, I think was actually kind of very clever uh, to probably use the, the trade, like the, the making it obvious they wanted to trade down so that they could gauge who wanted to get Penix and sure. then probably got a bunch of calls to trade up for Penix. And they were like, okay, well now we know we can't trade down because all these teams. So there's very, a lot of uh, gamesmanship there. So that's pretty, pretty clever. Um, but yeah, they wanted Latu, um, by all accounts. Latu oh, was the, so Latu. The so it wasn't Turner wanted. that they really wanted. It was Latu. Mm, it seems like it was Latu uh, that they wanted. I, you know, for me at at eight, if they weren't able to trade down, it would have been Roma Dunze. You know, I think you you'd go all in on the offense with with Kirk at that point. Sure. Um, but you know, if they were to trade down to thirteen, they probably would have been able to get Latu, given that he didn't go until fifteen. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. So you know it. It'll be a game of what if, like, what if you'd got the extra picks from that trade down and you got lot to oh, 13 yeah. and, you know, would that have been enough to potentially win a Super Bowl with Kirk or not? And and we'll have to see how it plays out. You know, maybe the team will be good enough with, with Kirk that everyone's fine with it. Maybe the team will be not good enough with, with Kirk that it probably wouldn't have mattered who they took you know, or whatever, but, um, well, we'll see, you know, that the most painful thing will be like getting to the conference championship and just not quite being good enough and be like, well, if we had law to or Rome or whatever, <laughs> yeah. we have won the Super Bowl, you know, and then, you know, that that's a dark timeline that will yeah. we'll, we'll that to happen before we speak that into existence. But uh, cool. yeah, they, but we'll see how, how it goes. But they this is more of a future focused, I think, uh, off season than most were expecting, especially after the Kirk signing came down. And it does take a lot of guts too, uh, considering uh, Raheem Morris, as you said, if he's really the one, uh, one of the top guys, and it, it sounds like it making the decisions that, Hey, uh, I feel confident or I know based on my conversations with, with management, with the owner, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm not going to get fired in a year or two. I'm going to do a good enough job because if, if you didn't feel that way, then you wouldn't care about getting a quarterback that is going to be, that may not even play for three or four years. So that's, that's also something that we have to take into account. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, Arthur Blank is one of the NFL's most patient owners. He he does not typically fire coaches before they've had three years. Um, that's usually he's been very consistent with that. So I don't think that that Morris and is is feeling a ton of, of pressure to win right away. But I, mean, I think he's feeling the pressure 
because anyone with eyes can see that the Falcons fan base is absolutely ravenous to get to the playoffs. They haven't done it since 2017. Arthur Smith tried and failed three times um, and, and did it the same way every year by basically neglecting the quarterback position and thinking that his scheme and, and the weapons he had assembled would be enough to cover up the problems. And that just kept getting worse. Um, and Raheem Morris is taking the opposite approach. He's like, they didn't want a quarterback. We're going to get two, you know? Yeah, so, sure. Uh, hey, so we'll, we'll see, him. we'll see how that, how that changes, but we all know quarterback is the most important position in the game. And, yep. you know, not to speak ill of Kirk Cousins before he even plays a snap for the Falcons, but his reputation, which is not really fair, but his reputation is that he's good enough to get you to the dance, but he's not going to be winning. He's not going to, yeah. you know, you're not, you're not coming away with the crown. Yeah. Um, and you know, is that, that's not written stone that, that, that he can't get you all the way there, but he is 36. You're probably, you probably have seen the best of cousins. Maybe he can have one like last year. He was playing his best ball. So there's no say there's, you know, there's no reason he can't continue to, to play at a high level, but you're probably going to get the downslope of cousins. If it's not this year, it'll be next year. And you're going to be looking to the future. Yep. Um. So, you know, hopefully by that, by the time cousins is, is sloping down, Penix will be sloping up and, um, you know, Penix is really interesting. I mean, obviously he's one of the most exciting prospects in this class. I think his, his age and injury history led to him sort of getting a, a little bit of a bad rap, but I think Penix, it was pretty clear that NFL teams viewed him as a top 15 talent. Like there oh, were yeah. multiple teams trying to get him in the top 10. And it, it's not surprising when you see like, okay, he's got arguably the best arm in the class other than Caleb Williams and, um, you know, all these traits, former dual threat quarterback, still very athletic, but Unlike a lot of dual threat quarterbacks, he has, you know, and Jaden Daniels, to his credit, has done this too, to some extent, like, like stopped running and become a pocket passer. You know, Jaden Daniels is still more of a dual threat, whereas Michael Penix basically completely changed his game to be a pocket passer that's after right. his injuries. Yeah. And that is really hard to do. Um, so that that's pretty impressive. And, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. But uh, definitely, definitely excited to, to <laughs> see how this pans out. Uh to, to Kirk Cousins' credit, on the I know a lot of people ask about the quarterback drama. It seems like Kirk Cousins is not interested in there being any any drama, and I think that's part of the reason they signed him is because they knew they knew Kirk was just such a nice guy. He like yeah. he wouldn't be able to like not be nice to to, to Michael Penix, and and he would just be able to handle it. And I think they that's were true. absolutely correct about that. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, hey, he's he's making good money, and he knows in yeah. a couple of years uh, whether he's there or not. It, it's it's only so long you can play. So yeah, all right, he got the contract he wanted. That that's you got, uh, that's they gave it. him the contract he wanted, so it's that's like it. you know you can't be too upset about that. No, take care of your family first, especially at that age. Okay, uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, this is the 2023 draft guide, so the 2024 guide will be out to draft review guide. So uh, we'll be uh, talking about all these teams, including the Atlanta Falcons. So check that out at ourlads.com. It's available. Uh, we'll actually uh, sh we should have it out in early June. Uh, within a couple of weeks uh, of of, uh, of June, um, and then uh, this is the draft guide that is out right now. So, um, out of all the picks that we're going to talk about here, uh, eight picks in all, um, I believe six of them uh, we have scouting reports on. So, I haven't checked any of the rookie free agents. Did the Falcons? Did who would be considered their top uh, college free agent that they signed after the draft? They, they had a pretty, uh, according, you know, I, you know, I'm a big, if you've watched any of my shows, folks, you know, Thor Nystrom and I are big, uh, big friends and he does his Thor 500 where he actually breaks down like the top 500 players, including all the UDFAs. And he was, I think he had the Falcons as having the 32nd of 32 ranked, you know, UDFA class. Cause they just didn't really sign any like of the big name guys, but okay. the one I would watch in terms of the UDFAs is uh, wide receiver, Isaiah Wooden, um, who had some just absolutely bonkers testing um, from college. I think he had like, if he had, I think, I can't remember which drill it was. I think it was either the short shuttle or the 10 yard. I think he had the fastest 10 yard split. Like he would have set an, a combine record for the fastest 10 yard split or tied it okay. based on his pro day. So, you know, little explosive, you know, crazy like athlete type of receiver um, that they apparently really like. So, you know, that that's one I would, I would be watching as like uh, maybe he, he can stick as a practice squad guy, but the rest I think are, are more like competing for practice squad and stuff at best. And honestly, they, the Falcons have just filled out the roster with so many 
veterans and, and guys that, you know, it's going to be tough for any UDFAs to make it. So I think they were okay. going a little bit lighter on this UDFA class. Well, what also stands out is the fact that for, and once you get past Penix, you have four straight uh, players on defense and not a surprise that, cause we talked uh, of course uh, to, to preview the, the off season and uh, let's see out of the needs that you, that we talked about uh, slot check Mark Rondell Moore, uh, wide receiver two check Darnell Mooney. Um, but uh, after, but the other th- one that I think is the biggest one, which was the top need of the team in the offseason, it was edge rusher. And uh, getting Braylon Trice is nice. Uh, there's a lot to talk about there with, with, with Trice. He's also seems to be a good prospect, both against the run and against the pass. So he seems like he's a complete player. Um, there's a lot to like there, high effort guy. So, uh, but after that, and in fact, if we scroll down here on the RLS.com uh, depth chart for the Atlanta Falcons, there really weren't any other additions to the pass rush at this point in time. Are you, is that enough? Do you think that's enough? Or is that something that they definitely still need to improve upon? And is it possible to improve upon that this season? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're... I, I don't know. I don't think it's enough. I mean, I, I also, they, they tried really hard to get multiple of the top edge rushers in free agency. They tried really hard for Daniel Hunter. He ended up choosing the Texans to go back home. Um, you know, apparently the Falcons had either the same financial offer or a slightly better one, but he went, but he chose to go home and you, it's really hard to beat that. Right. Um, the Falcons were involved in trying to get Montez sweat via trade and the bears outbid them with their higher second round pick. Um, you know, last during the season last year that they, they've been trying really hard. They tried to trade back into the first round to get one of the top three edge rushers that did not work either. Um, so they're definitely not, I think done, but I, I think that they, they've just struck out. And that's the thing with Font to know that I think people need to understand is that he has a number that this is what this player's worth. And we're not going to go over this because we, we can't, we can't give out bad contracts. That's his thing. Okay. He's the free agency pro personnel guy. Um, and I think that's led to him really not giving out bad contracts ever so far with the Falcons. And um, that also means that they sometimes will lose out on guys uh, and, and we'll have to see, but they, you know, obviously they invested a lot in, in the depth, right. And, and they've got a lot of guys that should be long-term contributors, hopefully, yeah. but you know, they're expecting Arnold Ebicady to be, to be better. Um, and this ob- obviously going back to a three, four should help him. You know, he's definitely more of a stand-up rusher playing with his hand in the dirt last year was not a great situation for him. He got what he got washed in the right. He was still a good pass rusher, but definitely couldn't hold up against the run uh, with his hand in the dirt. You know, they've got Lorenzo Carter also going back to the more of that stand up role. So, so maybe those guys are better there, but I still think you're really hoping for a lot. If you're expecting them to be good starters, you know, Braylon Trice, I think everybody likes Braylon Trice. There's really, he he's, I think the problem with Trice is that he's just kind of a one note rusher in that, he is a straight line power rusher who wins with effort and that's going to lead to him probably being a solid NFL starter. The reason he went in the third round is because I don't know that I think you kind of, what you see is what you get with Braylon Trice, where he's going to be a high effort hair on fire power rusher and he's going to be productive, but I don't think he's ever going to be a top edge rusher in the NFL. Sure. I think he's going to be yeah. a good long-term player and that's a great value in the third round, but um, he just doesn't, he doesn't bend, um, and he's got short arms and, you know, he's got some limitations, but you know, otherwise you like, you like that pick and he's going to contribute. But, um, to me, it seems like they're basically depending on their interior to carry the pass rush. Um, they've got David on They've got Greta Jarrett. When those two were healthy, I think the Falcons had a claim on a top three interior defensive line. Um, right. and they, the defense was dominant with those two in the lineup. It really started to fall off after both got hurt later in the season. Um, so, you know, Zach Harrison apparently is bulking up to play more of an interior role. That seems to be the buzz there. And he was already a really big edge rusher before, so doesn't have to add that much to get closer to that three, four defensive end size. So it seems okay. like that's going to be his role. Um, then they've got Brandon Dorless and Ruka Rororo to kind of be their, their primary depth guys on the interior. And I guess the hope, I think the hope is that they can just dominate inside and that'll allow their their outside rushers to not need to be right. leaned on as much. Um, 
I also think they're hoping to to let Caden Ellis rush the passer more just because he, he didn't really get a chance to do that a whole lot last year because Troy Anderson, who was supposed to be their primary inside guy, got hurt in week two, missed the whole season. So he had to basically become the the Mike, you know, middle linebacker. Yep. Um, and I think they want him to be more of that Romer blitzer type guy. So with okay. Troy Anderson back, then I think they're they're hoping he could return to that. So maybe th- I think they're going to have to cobble it together, is what I'm saying. But uh, you know, I would definitely keep an eye on on Edge still as as somewhere they could add if if there's someone they like. And I know they're still in touch with Clayus Campbell and um, stuff like that. So we'll we'll see if anything comes of that. But. Yeah, you say, I mean, you're right. Inside pass rushing is uh, sometimes now, I think, uh, more important uh, based on what we know, especially when it now, again, uh, the, the a lot of these older quarterbacks, the Brady's and well, Rogers is still there, hopefully, but uh, that's where you get these guys. You, 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 you have a much better chance of getting them. You, you put pressure on them inside and don't want them to move up into the pocket, that kind of thing. Um, which is, of course, is another big reason why the why the why the NFL likes uh, quarterbacks uh, that can uh, uh, maneuver back there. But uh, totally good point, and let's uh, pick up that point by talking about those players that they drafted up front. Because as you can see in the in um, orange, uh, that they added these row rookies uh, that they added three up front. You mentioned a row row row. You got Dorless, and then also with their final pick, Logue. So. Uh, now, what about Doorless? Because Doorless, you know, he, he's kind of perceived like, is he a tweener or is he just versatile? Is he a 4-3? Is he a 3-4? Is he uh, an edge? Is he uh, an inside? So did, it was all going to depend on who drafted him and what they thought about him. What do you think is the goal of where they want to put Brendan Doorless the most to be effective? Yeah, I think he's a 3-4 offensive end for them. Um, I think that's probably his best fit. I, I think he was always going to struggle to play outside in the NFL. Um, so I, I think they want him to play the 3-4 defensive end. He's probably going to be their their pass rusher there, You know, one of their, their main pass rushing rotational players. And I think the hope is that he can be someone who is, is a force to pass rush if D- David Onyemata and Grady Jarrett are on the field like they did because yeah. last year when those two guys left the field they just they lost their pass rush basically so they need more guys that can do that i think doorless can can do that and he'll have to bulk up a bit obviously you know i think playing in the two he was in the 280s at the combine that's probably not going to be enough at the nfl level but you know 283 to, to 290 295 you can do you can do like seven pounds in an off season but yes sure. he, he might take a little bit of time to get up to that that weight where he could be relied upon you know in terms of the run game but uh, I think they're hoping for him to be a primary pass rusher early. And then with, with Rook, I think it's the other way. I think we know he can play the run. Like he's a rock solid run yes. defender. Um, got that incredible length. Uh, he's versatile too. You know, he, I think Rook is truly versatile. Like Dorless is versatile. Rook is like, if you put 10 more pounds on him, he could play all five spots on the line. You know, yeah. he's going to be an interior guy, obviously, but um, they clearly view him as, as a very high ceiling potential like cornerstone piece of this defensive line trading up to get him over like uh you know some of those guys uh that that were higher rated on the draft board you know for a lot of people obviously knowing um I'm blanking on the name now but the uh the defensive tackle or just on Newton now knowing of course that he has had to have two foot surgeries on both feet now that's probably played a part in and yes. going above him but yeah um you know i was shocked i was like I, oh they're trading up for jerzon new this is a this is a coup yeah, right and then they took rook i think people were like what the hell and it's well yeah. now we know of course that they're jerzon newton has two, the two foot injuries so um but you know rook is is a work in progress as a pass rusher he's one of those guys where he's like so athletic that he can probably just get some sacks just because he'll he'll just blow past somebody but he's going to be more of the run defender and i, I think they want rook to play a lot on base downs so that grady Jarrett and david on your mind don't have to um, so I, I think that that should help the pass rush sort of by yep. distributing the snaps. And then I think Zion Logue is their long-term nose tackle, like developmental player. I'm not sure he's going to make the roster. I, I will say this. I had him making the roster under the assumption that Eddie Goldman was a mirage once again, because we've never actually seen Eddie Goldman practice with the Falcons until now we got okay. footage of Eddie Goldman at practice yesterday. So he's out there. He does exist. Um, 
So, you know, obviously if Eddie Goldman is like anything like previous Eddie Goldman, he's going to run away with the nose tackle job because he's okay. a very good player. It's been like three years since anyone's seen Eddie Goldman play football. <laughs> yeah. So um, he looks to be the right size, the right, you know, he looks like he belongs out there. Yep. Um, so if he if he can play, then great. And Zion looks probably a practice squad guy this year. Um, if Goldman can't play and doesn't make it, then you're probably, we're probably looking at, you know, Zion Logue is being thrust into that nose tackle role a little bit earlier than expected. But I think the idea is to let Zion sort of develop for a little bit longer. Um, obviously tremendous size. I mean, he's gigantic. Like you think Rook is big and then you see Zion Logue. He's like, oh, that's like Rook ate a power up mushroom and is like 30 pounds heavier, you know? So, um, so that they've, they prioritized a couple things, and this this is what Fontenot, for the most part, has done. Uh, he did deviate a little bit with the edge rushers this year, but he wants length uh, and and athleticism. And if you have the great length, you're gonna. That's one of the things the Falcons seem to prioritize the most. And with Rook and, and Zion in particular, you know that that was key. Um, you know, Eba Katie is another guy. Lorenzo Carter, Zach Harrison. Uh, all of these guys have outstanding length. That's been like a key thing that they look for in their their defensive linemen. Um, Braylon Trice, notably though, not ha- does not have great length, so they must just really like him. Uh, so, <laughs> well, like you said, you get good value, you take advantage of it. Um, yeah. D- by the way, D'Angelo Malone, uh, mm-hmm. maybe it's not too much of a surprise that he still hasn't uh, arrived. Is is there still hope that he can now that he's been around for a couple of years? I, he played a ton of special teams last year. So that if he's a good special teamer, that's always going to help him sort of like keep like stick around. Yeah. You know, if you're an edge rusher that can play special teams, that will help you be that last guy on the roster. I, I think he needs to be a three, four outside linebacker. So last year's four, three, he was probably not going to find a way onto the field with, yeah. with that. But, um, now that they're going back to the three, four with stand up rushers, I, I think he's got a, I think he, sh- I think he should make it over, like a James Smith Williams. I just think he has more upside. Um, you know, it depends on what they're looking for. But I, I, this is kind of the year where I think he needs to play on defense, oh, yeah. or or yeah. at least like be a primary depth guy. Or it's probably going to be ending soon. But I still like him. I mean, I think he just hasn't really got. He didn't get to play at all on defense in in his second season. Um, so you know, I I'm still hopeful of that. But yeah, this is kind of a, a critical training camp for him. Speaking of tweeners. I mean, that yeah. was really the big deal with him coming out, as you know, of college, uh, because mm-hmm. he put up tremendous numbers, but it was just, yeah. where does he fit? So that's the thing with the NFL. We talk about it all the time. A lot of, a, a lot of uh, uh, dealing with whether a player is going to have success when they come out of college is where do they land? What's the scheme? Yep. What's the staff? Mm-hmm. Right now, it hasn't worked out from Malone, but maybe back to the 3-4 and a new coaching staff will be just what he's looking for. Okay. Um, on defense, we have one more to go, and that is Bertrand. Now, Bertrand, to me, is like a carbon copy of Nate Landman. Well, that's a good thing because we talked last year, a couple years ago, I think it was, because that was uh, when he uh, came in, I believe, right? And that was the fact that, yes, he was injured, and that was the big deal, but he was so productive and so good as an inside linebacker in college. He just felt, if he was healthy, he could be an NFL player. And now he's healthy, and he contributed for the team last year. Now they bring in Bertrand. So I I thought that was very interesting. They got a couple of really good, uh, young, interior backup linebackers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you struck goal with Nate Lamb and obviously one of the premier run defending linebackers in the NFL last year coming in as, you know, uh, basically a UDFA from 2022. And obviously everyone's happy for Nate Lamb and sort of overcoming those debilitating injuries um, and, and getting back on the field. And uh, so, you know, the sky's the limit for Nate Lamb and, you know, we'll see. It's going to be a battle, I think, between him and Troy Anderson to see who actually starts. I think obviously they Troy Anderson has the the physical upside to just be a just one of one player in the NFL. I mean, we, you remember he was like a perfect 10 RAS at like five different positions, given his athletic. T- so, you know, he can do it all. Obviously he's the one that probably has the coverage upside that they want from their like Mike linebacker. Um, so we'll see, you know, I, I think they want Trey Anderson to win that job and yeah. having Nate Lamman as your top backup is, is great. You know, with JD Bertrand, I love taking linebackers on day three because it, you find starters there every year. Like you, you want smart guys uh, that know what they're doing, 
um, and are physical uh, and are good tacklers. And that's exactly what J.D. Bertrand is. Super yep. smart, experienced. Doesn't have elite size or athleticism, you know, more no. of like a, a, an average thing there. But even though he's really a, good on special teams. He is. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's great on special teams. So you know that he's going to he's gonna be your fourth linebacker. You don't have to worry about it. He can come in and play. He's going to play great special teams. You just check a box, um, yep. you know, and, and with a fifth round pick, if you can find a guy that is going to make your roster without question, that's always a great a great pick. So uh, Before we move out of uh, the defense, I got to ask you, because one of the spots that we talked about that we felt would there would be an upgrade at some point uh, was at the safety position. And uh, as you can see, nothing. So uh, no veterans, uh, no rookies. So, but the, if you look at the players remaining, the veteran free agents that are out there at the positions, in my opinion, the deepest position in free agency still left is safety. So yeah. do you think the Falcons will add one of those safeties at some point? And if so, who? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, but Raheem Morris has gone out of his way to sort of talk up Richie Grant and that's great. You know, UCF legend, Richie Grant, but um, it's, <laughs> it, you know, I, I'm not really trying to ride that train again. Um, and this, and this sort of Fangio style defense, at least that's what we sort of think it's going to be. You're typically going to have a, a more box focused safety and a more free focused safety. And obviously Jesse Bates is going to be the free safety, but maybe that makes it so a guy like DeMarco Hellams, who is a little bit limited in coverage, but very physical and played, quite well as as an enforcer type safety as a seventh round pick last year maybe that's good enough if he's going to be more restricted to the box maybe you can get by with that you want more than that but you know you can't necessarily fix everything in one season so um but yeah i mean i think you know i i i don't know why they haven't put in a call to john johnson yet from the rams it's like he he's played in this defense for years he knows exactly what to do he's not going to be crazy expensive um you know i would just sign john johnson let him duke it out just bolster the, the safety room with him and, and be done with it. But we'll see. Um, it seems like they're, they're committed to just having as many young and like competitive, like young players as they can until camp. And then we'll probably see some more veterans added later, but you know, the same thing at corner, right? They did, they, they added Antonio Hamilton in free agency, but that's it. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay. Uh, you know, again, it's like, Oh, Akello Witherspoon from the Rams, right? A guy who started, basically all season last year wasn't very expensive and did a decent job. Obviously knows the scheme, you know, I don't know why he's not in here. Yeah. But uh, it seems like they're, they're, they're wanting to sort of ride out the summer with the young players and see if they can find any diamonds in the rough. And and then we'll probably see some veterans at it later. Okay. Uh, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And, and, and by the way, D Alfred, you, 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 you feel that he is without question the starting nickel. He should be. I mean, if he, <laughs> I know, I know, they, they, they pitched him last enough. year that for no reason. I mean, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, D. You must be tired from returning those punts. Uh, so we're, you're no longer a starter. Uh, yeah, no. D. Alford should be the, the starter without question. But I, the, Jerry Gray loves my cues. You know, another UCF legend. But, you know, this is this is really hurting me to argue against these UCF legends uh, all the okay. time. But, yeah, yeah if true. I can say it, then it must be true. So That's true. That's uh, give him credit. Okay, uh, offensively, besides Penix, uh, there was only those last two picks. Excuse me, the, the two of the last three in the sixth round. Uh, McClellan, a running back, and Washington, the wide receiver from Illinois, who really just had one good year. That was last year. Uh, McClellan, same thing, really. Uh, so both guys uh, coming off a good one final last season on their teams. Uh, McClellan has had a couple of uh, injuries uh, that he's uh, been dealing with, so I know that was important as far as uh, his medicals. Um, do you do they look at McClellan as again another? He should be able to help on special teams right away, and but he's more of like a kind of like a developmental guy, kind of like a guy that we're going to put him on the roster. He's going to play special teams, and then hopefully in a couple of years he can be a part of like a three back rotation. Yeah, I, I think they like McClellan because he can do like he can fill in. Um, they just didn't really have a great option if if Bijan or Algier had to miss time last year. Um, but especially because Avery Williams was out for the the season. Yep. So they yep. were just really thin there. And Jace McClellan, really good pass blocker, um, does kind of checks the boxes. He can, he can do a little bit of everything. He doesn't have the upside of those other two guys, but he's going to be the third running back. I imagine he can, he can pass protect if you need him to, he could catch some passes. He could do, he could do all that stuff. Um, I don't think he's like a super high upside player, but I think he's, he's 
good. Like I think obviously the injuries hurt his draft stock and um, you know, I, I think they just wanted to make sure they had a third guy in here to, to care, to take carries if, if they were missing one of their top guys, um, because Avery Williams isn't really a running back that can take yeah. a lot of carries. He's, yeah. he's very much like a, a returner change of pace only type of running back. And we've seen it before where like the Falcons had injuries. Then it's like, okay, we got to give Avery Williams like seven carries, 10 carries. That's, that's a lot for him. Um, so I think they wanted uh, a more solidified running back to do that with, with Jason McClellan. And then they'll have Avery Williams play mostly return stuff, maybe some gadgety stuff, but um, yeah, I like McClellan. He's, I think he's going to, going to make the roster for sure. I think he'll end up being the, the running back three in terms of guys that are actually going to play snaps. Um, but okay. g- given like uh, what we're probably going to see is Bijan just play as much as he can. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Too, yeah. Algier played the other ones and then yeah. you got know, no problems there. Then Jason yeah. Will yeah, no, I, I think, I think Bijan's going to play this year. There's your, fa- if people were wondering that fantasy question. Um, I mean, the, the Rams ran Kyron Williams, who's like a small running back, like 75% of the snaps. So if they can run him that many snaps, I think that, uh, that, you know, probably going to see Bijan the same thing. So. What was that? Uh, uh, Kyron Williams, you know, that the Rams used him as yes. like a bell cow and he's not a big guy. That's true. You got Bijan. It's like, okay, I think he's going to get the same right. treatment. Even, you know, and no offense to Kyron had a tremendous season. Um, Bijan's like his own level of talent, even, even compared to someone as good as Kyron. So, and again, that's a good point because Zach Robinson, uh, we talked about this, uh, on our previous, uh, video, uh, of course he's coming in from the Rams and that's why, uh, no team, I think, in the NFL is going through a bigger transition scheme wise on offense yeah. than the Atlanta Falcons. So, yes, um, going, going from, from not uh, using, the, yeah, yeah, I think you're about to make the same exact point. Yeah. yeah. So, so, the, um, you know, what the, the fewest 11 personnel snaps to the most in one offseason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Washington. What do they, what do they see in Washington? Well, they like him a lot. He's basically been the primary target during rookie mini camp OTAs. Um, you know, as as the other guys are, you know, obviously Drake London and these big name guys weren't there at, at sure. rookie mini camp. But um, Washington has been the star so far of of the wide receiver group. Um, you know, with not everyone there, so it's very early. But um, I I think they view him as you know, this is a, a guy that we can get immediate stuff out of he's a very experienced wide receiver like you yeah. said never really only came on strong this last year had a tremendous send-off game uh right i think multiple touchdowns 200 yards in his final game in college um so that opened some eyes you know i think you, you look at him and this is where everyone goes and you know with the rams connection it's it's inevitable but he has very similar measurables to puka so everyone's like oh is he the falcons <laughs> maybe he is in terms of like he can play that role and he was taken, you know, like in the middle to the late portion of day three, he's not going to be like a 1400 yard receiver Puka, but yeah. I think they like him as a big slot, a guy that can also play outside. I think he'll probably be Drake London's backup, but I think this year, you know, I was telling people like, he's probably like trying to beat out Kadero Hodge as like a primary special teamer, you know, a bigger receiver. Cause they don't have as many big receivers now. Like last year it was like, we don't have small receivers. We don't like them. We don't want them. If you can't block, then get off my team. Now it's like Drake London and Casey Washington and, and Kadero Hodge are the only receivers like, you know, in the starting lineup that uh, are above six foot. So you okay, know, yeah. just, that they've really gone small, um, you know, with Darnell Mooney, small Rondale Moore, you know, thick, but smaller, like shorter, uh, you know, Ray Ray McLeod, small, um, you know, a lot of Jaquay Jackson, Isaiah Wood, and all these like UDFAs, smaller guys. Um, they did, they do have some other guys that are bigger, like Joshua Lee and Chris Blair and Matt Austin and those guys. But, um, yeah, in terms of the, the guys that are likely to make the roster, it's probably going to be a lot of small guys. And again, more big transitions for this Falcons team. And, and really, uh, what's important to note too, though, is, is that when you take a look at the depth chart and you mentioned Hodge and you mentioned McLeod, well, well that's six receivers. That means, do you feel that this is their team? That they're not going to, they're going to trust what they have? Because again, if you're, if you're running a lot of 11 personnel, you have one injury, you, you need depth. And uh, to make it run properly, do you think they have the adequate depth? And give me some players. You mentioned Jackson. We, you already mentioned Wooden. Are, right now, if they did keep, uh, let's say, 
I don't know if they're going to keep seven, but let's just say six or seven receivers to the, to the active roster. Um, do you think Wooden and Jackson or anyone else, because there's a bunch of names there, have a legitimate shot, you think, to make it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen enough of these guys to know for sure, but I, I think Wooden is definitely one to watch. You know, he's he's kind of more in that sort of slot role that they're going after, which is these, like, very athletic uh, slot receivers. You know, Ronda Moore obviously is a tremendous athlete. I know that the Falcons have talked him up to a ridiculous level. They, they say that all the advanced stats tell you that Rondell Moore is a really good slot receiver, just waiting to be unlocked. And I certainly hope they're right about that because they really didn't do anything else to address that spot. You know, Ray McLeod is kind of like a lighter version of Rondell Moore and that he could do some of the same stuff, but doesn't have the, you know, Rondell Moore is just like built almost like a running back in, in some ways, whereas McLeod is definitely more of a slighter build. So Wooden is kind of more like a Ray Ray McLeod style player, very athletic, but, but slighter. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I'm watching Isaiah Wooden. We've seen Josh Ali make this roster multiple times over the last couple of years as like a versatile guy. You know, I don't think there's a whole lot there, but he's so- someone to watch. And then, um, Mac Austin, they brought in from the CFL, who's another bigger receiver. You know, I'm interested to see if he can make any noise, but yeah, I mean, I, I think if that, I think they're going to carry six and I think that the six are the, the top six guys, you know, that okay. you guys have on your depth chart. Um, and then they're probably going to carry a bunch of guys on the practice squad, probably like two or three, um, okay. and then go from there. But I, I think they, they view Casey Washington as a guy they can depend on to step in. If they have an injury, we know Kadero Hodge can play too. He, he played well last year. Um, he can play outside inside. So they, they have some decent depth. It's not like great depth. Like if you had Roma Dunze in this room, it'd be like, Oh wow. Okay. Now this <laughs> yeah. is a great wide receiver core, yeah. but um, <laughs> you know, so it's a little bit thinner than it could have been. Um, and I'm, yeah. I think a lot of people were shocked again, that we didn't see a wide receiver pick earlier in this, in this class, but um, it was a deep class and they, they clearly felt like they could just wait and get somebody they liked later. Uh, and, and hopefully Casey Washington is that guy, but yeah, everyone's like, Oh, he's the Falcons new Puka Nakua. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. Relax. Let's, maybe not everyone is Puka Nakua. Okay? No, that was <laughs> not pretty crazy. Is, yeah. 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 But, and it also shows you, uh, what kind of a coach they have and a quarterback. So not to say cousins isn't good, but, uh, that's, uh, that's, that was all, all the, all the stars just aligned and, yeah. uh, that's why it's special. Okay. Yep. So, um, those are the draft picks. I'm going to ask you a few more uh, things before I let you go. We've already talked a little bit about some of the other needs. So uh, we mentioned uh, maybe their safety, uh, at maybe some more edge rush. Do they need more? Because uh, this is something else we talked about. Do they? Because they didn't seem to add. Do they need more out, uh, offensive tackle depth? They really like Storm Norton. When he had to fill in last year, he was good. Like the best he'd ever played. I think they're pretty happy with him. They brought okay. him back. Tyler Vrabel also had to play a game when the Falcons actually lost two tackles in one game. Um, and he basically uh, shut down the Bucks pass rush as a U- former UDFA. So I think they're pretty happy with their depth tackles right now that they feel okay. like they've got two guys they can, they can develop. I think, you know, long-term you're looking for a Caleb McGarry replacement because I think it's pretty clear that this team is going to a more pass first focused. Um, I think pretty much everyone else on the roster is absolutely fine with a more pass f- first approach, except Caleb Gary, who we know is, is very That's much a run focused tackle and yeah. um, has struggled in pass pro. Now he was fine last year. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a huge problem, but I think if you're going to Kirk cousins, Michael Penix, you know, the, the Falcons are probably going to prioritize getting a, a pass protection focus, right? Tackle. Um, but that's probably not going to be this year. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean, it, I think they're probably they're pretty happy with their their offensive line as a whole. I think they okay. they're they're more or less going to return every single player on the depth chart from last year. Um, you know, they're they're keeping Storm Norton. Uh, they re-signed. You know, they got Ryan Newsel who had to play center for a game or two, and he did a good job filling in. They've got veteran Kyle Hinton who who has been able to play tackle and guard before. They've got their their seventh round rookie Javon Gwynn um, in the building too, so they're probably just going to keep the same you know eight or so offensive linemen they kept last year uh, going into this year, and that that's that continuity we we know it's important for the offensive line, so I think that's what they're they're hoping for. Really, we're just hoping that Matthew Bergeron like takes the next step because he okay. was fine last year, but not necessarily a difference making left guard. So if he can become a difference making left guard, then all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at this. This was already like a top 10 offensive line. But if you could get Bergeron to, to sort of take that step, I think you're feeling pretty good about where this is headed. 
Yeah, because it, it, it did happen pretty quickly. They did a really good job over the last couple of years transforming the offensive line, and it wasn't like they needed to do a whole lot. They just had a hit with some of their mm-hmm. picks, and and also it was nice that Dahlman – uh, has now become a fixture there, at least uh, for now at center. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, McGarry. Um, uh, but yeah, this will be a big year. Okay. So um, let's talk about the, oh, g- one more. G- give me a, a player. Cause we just talked about some veterans. If you had to just pick one veteran free agent that they'll sign notable name, who would it be? Yeah, I think to me, the one, that I keep coming back to. And I know we, we talked about him earlier. You know, I, I think I'm just really on John Johnson uh, as, okay. as the guy that I, I think that He's they the should guy. just go get, um, okay. you know, I, I don't, you know, the fact that they haven't yet is a little bit interesting because you, you'd think those sides would want a reunion. So like, you know, why hasn't it happened? Um, but, you know, I, I think either him or Akilah Witherspoon or one of these uh, freeze, I don't, I don't think they really want to spend like a huge amount on it like i don't know that they want to go sign you know justin simmons or any of these super expensive safeties i think they feel like they're they're okay if they get more of a mid-level guy to just pair with with jesse bates but i think that that's definitely someone they like and then you know corner is the same thing like maybe they go for an akella witherspoon or or somebody like that to help solidify that room um you know there's johnson's the big name yeah that's the one if it's just that's the one one you want but yeah yeah you think, I think you think it's possible they want him as well. Is that something I, that yeah? Yeah, I I, I hope so. I, I okay. hope they do, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, right. It would be nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're there. So uh when they're there and the Falcons have the money, right? Yeah, they could they have the money to they haven't really pushed their cap at all. Uh okay. they have not restructured, they have not extended AJ Terrell yet. They haven't really done much to create space that they, they could probably create 50 million if they needed to. Um, so like yeah it doesn't seem like they're going to which again is is sort of me saying like wow this is more future focused than i was anticipating like it seems like they're sort of content to leave contracts alone as much as they can and then we'll see you know if they need to to touch stuff but basically they they have they they can make any money they they need to at this point all right uh overall grade what did you did you already give them one for the draft yeah yeah, I'll give him a C. I mean, I think this is a wait and see draft, so that's why it's a C. Um, you know, and, and pretty much all drafts are like that. If we're all being honest with ourselves, it should be. Just yeah. give every draft a C, but that's boring. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's for the content, right? But yeah. um, you know, I I think I can't go any lower than C because when you when you gamble on a quarterback like that, it's really just a, we're going to see in two years if we're correct about this, and if it is, and it's an A plus. Um, I I do like the defensive line emphasis. You know, uh, I didn't love trading up for Ruka Roro, but you know you hindsight is is something right and and you saw the rams make the most expensive second round trade like in nfl history pretty quickly after the falcons traded for rook to go get uh brayden fisk you know and they traded drastically more than the falcons did uh to go get brayden fisk so clearly there was there were a lot of teams in a blitz to get those interior guys there um which surprises me that Dorless didn't go until the fourth round after we saw these guys fly off the board but um yeah i think it's a c i think you like the defensive line picks. We need to see these day two picks actually hit because that's been Fontenot's biggest weaknesses. These day two picks have just not panned out. Obviously, Bergeron looks promising, so that could be a good step in the right direction. And, um, you know, I'm not writing off Troy Anderson or anything like that, considering he missed his second year with an injury. But, um, you know, we need to see some of these second round picks pan out, and this could be a good year for that to potentially happen. Um but uh, I like the I like the emphasis on the defensive line that they've needed to do that for a while. They didn't really do it in the way people thought they would, but they they did still emphasize it. So we'll see how that pans out. All right. Now, um, where did Penix go in our draft? I think he went right before me in like the second round, or maybe. Okay. I don't know maybe why I can't. Right after. Uh, they've like disappeared. Yeah, the, the mock the draft's kind of hard board. to pull up after it's over. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, but yeah, I, I do remember that. I remember that he was mm-hmm. kind of one of the one of the quarterbacks that was like he was he was last out of the top five. I know that. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's because he's not going to play for two years. So people are like, well, do I really want to stash this guy for two years, you know, yeah. and take up a roster spot? And like, yes, yeah, somebody will, um, but wasn't going to be me. I don't have any. I don't have any room for quarterback stashes. I I don't even you know at this point I'm so desperate for quarterback 
because I, I took the, the bad bets of uh, Justin Fields and Desmond Ritter last year. So, um, you know, that was wow. not great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah fields, so. we don't know yet about Fields. So, yep, yep. you know, he's a it better could, coach it could now. Yeah, it could yeah. change, you know. Your former maybe. coach is coaching him now. So. Oh, great. Yeah, that makes me, that fills me with <laughs> so much confidence. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, uh, no. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Okay. So uh, before I let you go, I want to talk about the schedule. So what was the reaction by the fans? What did you think about the schedule? Yeah, it's four primetime games after not having any the previous year. So what a difference a quarterback makes um, or two, maybe. Uh, it, so it, yeah, the Falcons are playing a lot of primetime games. They're playing a lot of primetime games early. They have three in the first five weeks. So the, the, the national audience is going to get to know this Falcons team. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll see how that goes that they, they have a brutal opening. Um, they play Pittsburgh at home, which theoretically is not that difficult, but the Falcons have only beaten the Steelers twice in NFL history. So, you know, that, uh, makes it a little bit more difficult, you know, that they, the Steelers have just typically had their number, but it, it is in Atlanta. It's week one. We know the Steelers often open the year a little bit, uh, shakier than they finish. They always finish strong. It seems like. Um, but, uh, week two, you know, they have to play the Eagles in Philly, uh, and then they have to come home and play the chiefs. So they have to go through a gauntlet those two weeks and they go, they come, they stay at home and, and play the saints in week four. Um, yeah, that is, that is, a, that is a pretty tough yeah. uh, way to start the season. That's almost yeah. like, man, we better beat Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah. They have to beat Pittsburgh or they're looking at Owen three going into that saints game. And that would be bad. Now yeah. the, the finish of the season is like six winnable games in a row. So you know, they, they can always make, they can probably make up ground there, but that's what we've said every season with this team. Um, you know, and they've failed to make up ground there essentially. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's not a hard schedule on, on, in terms of the teams they're playing, but the, the, the early arrangement is tough. Um, yeah, doesn't yeah look bad they, at all. They, that, that, that second half, especially after the bye week they're probably going to have to make up ground. Um, and they, you know, they, they, the thing is, is the Bucks played just an absolutely brutal schedule. They got to play the 49ers. They got to play the Ravens. Wow. They got to play, you know, first place. Like, yeah. And so they get this gauntlet, uh, and the Falcons don't. And it's like the, yeah. if the Bucks, like if the Bucks just falter a little bit and just end up as like a seven or eight win team, the Falcons probably just run away with the division at like 10 wins just because, like, you know, it, the Falcons just have the easier schedule. So, like, that's it the win totally total. mean that it doesn't, that's why they're nine have, and a half. Yeah. Yeah, it's just which like, I thought well, was kind probably... of high. I was like, wait a second, <laughs> nine and a half for the Falcons, but the quarterback. Dave, a lot of this is all about the schedule. Yep. So you know, and we'll see how these teams actually turn out. But um, they're probably going to go on a winning streak that last you know month or two of the season. Hopefully, finish strong and go to the playoffs with some momentum. But um, you know, it, they got to survive that opening. That's the only thing. Yes. I think they they got to win week one. Then you can weather a couple of losses from the Eagles and the chiefs. And then hopefully you, you come back home in week four to, to beat up on the saints. Um, and, and that then all should be well, if you just leave week four at two and two with a win over the saints and, and you're it. totally fine. So, yeah, because there's only one really good team. Maybe uh, once you get past that first three and that's Dallas. Um, yeah. Yeah. You play Dallas. We don't know. You, you know, we don't, we don't know. know. We don't know about the Chargers. We'll we don't know about some yeah. of these other teams. So, yep. That's why uh, the schedule is the that's schedule. Why you, that's why you play the games. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. We saw in the AFC with all those quarterbacks that got uh, yeah. sidelined that it just made life a lot easier for uh, good old lucky. They, they, they seem to never get any injuries kit the Kansas City Chiefs. They yes. just keep moving on. No injuries. More like off the field stuff, it seems like with the Chiefs. <laughs> yeah. And they can handle that. But. Yeah. On the field, yeah, they've been pretty fortunate. You know, one of these years, you would think it'll catch up to them. It has to. I mean, come on. Maybe, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, as I just would like to see the competition, though. That's it. Again, I know Atlanta's in the NFC, but the AFC could be a lot more competitive and uh, if they can keep those quarterbacks healthy. So, yeah. I hope, hope that we get more healthy quarterbacks this year. That's for Yeah, sure. last year was just That was just brutal for fantasy. That was brutal for oh, fantasy. Yeah, so, it's terrible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had Aaron Rodgers. And yeah. uh, so, yeah. Um, it, it, it's uh, uh, and then you got Deshaun Watson, and we can go on and on. So, um, it, and it was just brutal last year. The amount of quarterbacks, I think, I don't even know if it was a record, it might have been, 
but the way yeah. everybody was talking about it because it felt like it. It was just so many. We were watching, we're looking at so many second string and third string quarterbacks, and it was like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope it. I hope that uh, we all hope it, it comes to an end uh, and mm-hmm. uh, we we can get these guys back. It just overall much better football. Okay, so Kevin, uh, you have the show on YouTube now. Is that five days a week? Yeah, just it, we do. How do you do that? We do Wednesdays live, and then we usually do two other uh, recorded shows, usually Monday, Friday, uh, for that. Um, you know, now that we're going to the offseason, we might go down to two some weeks. Um, but yeah, it's usually you know between two to three shows a week, and um, eight p.m. Eastern on Wednesday nights. If you're looking for that live Falcons coverage, we just did uh, part one of our season predictions on Wednesday. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, we've done a lot of work on Penix and uh, on the draft and the offseason. So if you you know, if you want to watch about six or seven shows on that topic, uh, they're all lined up uh, and, and people did watch them because uh, people are just obsessed with Michael Penix and that whole decision. And it's fascinating. It's going to be fascinating seeing it play out, too. So, by the way, uh, Manuel Cor- Correa, uh, he has a comment here. Uh, Ram fan here. You guys smashed the draft. Oh, okay. So, well, look. I mean, I, I sure hope so. I, 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 sma- I hope smash is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's typically true. It is. Typically it is. You <laughs> typically, know. Yeah. Uh, typically. Yeah. I mean, it could be like we just broke it. Uh, no. Repair, but yeah. I'm, no, I'm going to go with Penix, Trice, uh, Ruko, Roro, and Dorla is going to be killer. Yeah. I, I, I think it could. It absolutely can work out. At least, at least there is. Uh, there's a lot of upside with this draft. So that that's what we're holding on to at this point. So. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, uh, Manuel, you have nothing to worry about there because I believe your general manager is the most underrated in football. So yeah. he's yeah. done a great job the last couple of years. And you mentioned Fisk. I'm a huge Fisk fan. So I'm mm-hmm. not surprised the Rams gave away what they gave away. That guy's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, he's not Aaron Donald, but he's going to be awesome. So uh, I love what the Rams do on the, in the draft, and uh, that's going to be uh, – you don't have to worry about them because uh, you played Seattle, right, out of the West this year, I, I noticed, I think. I saw, yep, saw that. Yep, Seattle. Okay. Mm-hmm. What are the divisions that you play? You play the AFC, uh, NFC East mm-hmm. and uh, AFC, West. Yeah, AFC West. AFC um, West, okay. Mm-hmm. So you, those are the two divisions, okay. Yep. All right, so anyway, we're out of here. Kevin, appreciate it as always. We'll definitely be talking Atlanta Falcons football at some time uh, around training camp to preview the upcoming season. We'll have a lot more to talk about, hopefully. Just like hey, fans, we all hope during the summer, no news is good news. So we don't want to hear anything about our teams in the, in the summer because the only thing you can hear about injuries. So uh, hopefully it's a quiet summer, even though, again, it's possible the Falcons will add a player. Uh, we know who's on the top of your wish list. So best of luck there. And uh, again, thanks. uh, Thanks for doing this, Kevin. Always appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. You got it. Don't forget, subscribe, like, and share. And uh, if you want to check out more Atlanta Falcons football, check out the falcoholic.com and also their YouTube channel. We'll see you next time here on the R-Lads football YouTube channel.